The eruption of Mount Vesuvius and destruction of Pompeii has fascinated people ever since the discovery of the city's remains in 1748 and has been a popular topic in literature for over 250 years. It has even been proposed that the effect of Pompeii's literary reception has been greater than that of the remains themselves. Authors tend to include information from both the excavations and Pliny's and Diocasius's literary accounts of the event. Pompeii reception in modern literature ranges from late 18th and early 19th century poems celebrating the excavation, such as Friedrich Schiller's elegy, Friedrich Schiller's elegy Pompeii and Herculaneum, to historical novels based on archaeological finds, starting with Edward George Bulwer Lytton's The Last Days of Pompeii, which became particularly influential and served as a model for later literary reception of Pompeii. In late 18th and early 19th century literature, the Vesuvius eruption tends to be interpreted as Pompeii's punishment for its decadence, often in combination with the motif of a Christian salvation, taking their cue from Bulwer Lytton, who introduced the idea of a Christian community at Pompeii, for which, however, no firm evidence exists. 20th century depictions, in contrast, tend to use Pompeii in a more trivialized way, as a backdrop in crime stories and other popular fiction. Pompeii became the subject of children's literature in the 19th century German novels, such as Schäfer's Pompeii, eine Erzählung für die Jugend, Hempels im Feuerregen, Erzählung aus den letzten Tagen Pompeis, or Körbers Diomedes and Claudius, Historische Erzählung aus den letzten Tagen von Pompeii. In recent decades, the Vesuvius eruption has been relative, a relatively popular subject in children's literature. But despite the number of children's fiction and non-fiction works published internationally on the subject, the books as a group have as yet not been the subject of any study. My study focuses on the reception of the 79 AD eruption of Mount Vesuvius in late 20th and early 21st children, century children's novels for older primary school and middle school age children, specifically Swiss author Jacob, Jakob Streit's Milon und der Löwe, Irish writer Eilish Dillon's The Shadow of Vesuvius, British-American Caroline Lawrence's The Secrets of Vesuvius and The Pirates of Pompeii, British author Sue Reed's My Story Pompe Pompeii, A Roman Girl's Diary, AD 78-9, and American writer Dan Gutman's Flashback for The Pompeii Disaster. As examples for the different ways which children's books from a number of countries deal with the topic both in the 21st century and in the 1970s. Gutman's, Lawrence's and Reed's books are aimed at readers, readers aimed approximately 9 to 12 years. Streit and Dillon's at a slightly older age group of about 10 to 13 years. Streit and Dillon's narrations are examples for an earlier novel on the topic, which has slower pace and focus on slavery. Lawrence's novels are detective novels set around the time of the eruption. Reed's book shows the events through the eyes of a slightly older girl than Lawrence's protagonist Flavia, presenting the event in form of a diary, and Gutman's story is an example for a humorous retelling of the disaster. In all of these novels, the eruption is part of a larger narrative, which predominantly focuses on broader themes, such as being a girl in an ancient Pompeii, slavery or early Christianity. Some of the more recent novels on Pompeii, especially from the USA, are more focused on humor than the horror of the eruption, contrasting especially, but not exclusively, earlier stories from the 1970s, which are clearly intended to be thought-provoking about wider historical or social issues. Lawrence's books on the topic are of particular note, as one of her book, books ends with the eruption and the survival of the protagonists, while the first chapters of the following volume deal with the immediate aftermath of the disaster and its effects on people and the environment. A number of children's novels on the topic show small groups of two or four children time traveling from contemporary times to Pompeii in order to solve a quest, be it taking a photo of the eruption or finding a clue to a riddle. The protagonists can be accompanied by pets, usually dogs or cats, sometimes even speaking animals. The pets are used to add humor to the story and help characterize the child protagonist as caring. Other novels tell the story of imaginary children in antiquity. In these stories too, animals often play an important role, either as the child character's object of affection or part of the storyline, like the lion Milon befriends in Milon and Der Löwe. Several of the stories refer to aspects of Roman religions and early Christianity. 
Stories from classical mythology are often included too, as they are needed for the narrative and for didactic reasons. In Lawrence's Secrets, the children even have a school lesson on mythology, complete with a vast painting as teaching material. In contrast, a few authors are trying very hard to make their novels appear anti-intellectual, which is a recent trend in children's books with ancient themes, as also seen, for example, in Rick Riordan's Percy Jackson series, while at the same time trying to teach their young readers some ancient history. This presentation will look at the reasons why the eruption is discussed in three of these novels, so that this presentation won't get too long. Um, the novels I look at are Milon und der Löwe, The Pirates of Pompeii, and Flashback for the Pompeii Disaster. Questions considered are, how close in detail is the description of the warning signs and the actual eruption to the ancient sources, in particular Pliny's letter 616 and 620, and Cassius Dio 66 to 21 to 23? What else do readers of these novels find out about life in 1st century AD Italy? What is the tone, purpose and effect of the inclusion of this event in the narrative? Is it mainly a backdrop for the story, a dramatic ending to it, or are the disaster and the learning opportunity it may offer to the young protagonist foregrounded? Is the eruption employed mostly for didactic purposes, entertainment or both? Milon und der Löwe by Swiss author Jacob Stre Jakob Streit tells the story of the Greek slave Milon, who after many adventures in Greece, Pompeii, Egypt and Rome, including his friendship with a lion, who later saves Milon's life, meets a group of Christians and converts to Christianity. In 1879, Milon is sold to a master in Pompeii, the same Pomponianos who is mentioned in Pliny, Pliny's letter 6.16.12. Here Milon experiences and survives the eruption of Mount Vesuvius. This novel combines several popular fiction and non-fiction narrations from antiquity. Pliny's account of the Vesuvius eruption, including the appearance of Pliny as a character in the story, Aesop's fable about Androcles and the lion, which, which was subsequently link, linked to Christianity, stories of false accusations of thefts, similar to the tale of Benjamin's alleged theft of Joseph, Joseph's silver goblet in um, Genesis, and some short references to classical mythology. The author brings alive his setting of ancient Pompeii through vivid descriptions of the streets and shops of the city. Details such as Pompeii's wealth, the excellent bread and graffiti on buildings and walls help readers visualize the place where this part of Milon's story is set. Only a small part of Milon de Löwe centers around the Vesuvius eruption. When Milon arrives at Stabiae, he immediately notices the column of smoke rising out of the mountain, which is explained as Vulcan had being at work in his underground forgery. Shortly after, Milon learns from his overseer about the earthquake that destroyed Pompeii 16 years earlier and notices signs of damage from the previous day's earthquake when he visits Pompeii. When another severe earthquake hits, Milon, his master and fellow slaves flee by boat from Pompeii to Pomponianus' villa in Stabiae. The eruption is described carefully following Pliny's letters 616 and 620 in many details regarding the eruption itself and people's reactions to it. Pliny the Elder actually appears as a character in the story, and readers witness his death. The narration, however, diverts from Pliny's description when Milon and a fellow slave, having ventured into buried Pompeii, rescue a little boy from the ruins, highlighting Milon's courage and kind-heartedness. The Vesuvius eruption mostly serves as an interlude in the main story of the protagonist's conversion to Christianity. The purpose of this passage, within the overall narration, is to help characterize the protagonist, to add an exciting survival story to the plot, and to teach readers about an important event in ancient history. We meet the historical figure Pliny as a character, whose calmness as a rational scientist and experienced general strongly contrasts with and highlights Pomponianus' panic as all his wealth and influence is no help of no help in the disaster. This passage shows that in a crisis situation, slaves and masters experience the same fear. Fleeing from the eruption, they literally sit in the same boat. Furthermore, the disaster leads to the separation of Milon and his fellow slave and friend Turios, who is ordered to move with Pomponianus to Rome, while Milon is sold to a new master, so portraying the powerless of slaves to influence their fates. Another important topic is the Romans' alleged moral religious downfall. Milon wonders if the gods destroyed Pompeii in order to punish its people. Have the gods sent this destruction as punishment for unatoned sins? But in this way, many innocent would be suffering for the crimes committed by others. Or is humanity 
like one large body, where hidden sin and atonement cancel each other out. Even though this passage clearly contains Christian ideas and terminology, the novel mentions no Christians at Pompeii, but Milon only is converted later in Rome. Streit was strongly influenced by Rudolf Steiner pedagogy, and in keeping with this, it was his stated aim to lead his readers to a deeper understanding of nature and humanity. Both aspects are foregrounded in, this scene, in the scene of the Vesuvius eruption, with its focus on the description of both the natural phenomenon as well as people's reaction to the crisis. British-American author Caroline Lawrence's The Roman Mystery Series tells of the adventures of girl detective Flavia Gemina, an energetic, well-born Roman girl living in the first century AD, and her three friends, Jewish Christian Jonathan, African slave Nubia, and Greek street boy Lupus. The series follows the children as they grow up together and solve mysteries all over the empire, three of them in Pompeii. Two of Caroline Lawrence's the Roman mystery books deal with the 79 AD um, Vesuvius disaster, The Secrets of Vesuvius and The Pirates of Pompeii, both from 2001. Secrets describes the lead up to the eruption, the disaster itself, and the protagonist's escape. Pirates describes the aftermath of the, of the disaster with a particular focus on refugees and escaped slaves. Today I will only look at the second book, The Pirates of Pompeii. Lawrence's 2001 novel, novel, The Pirates of Pompeii, deals with the aftermath of the eruption of Mount Vesuvius. It starts in a refugee camp south of Stabiae. Shortly after the, in, after the secrets of Vesuvius ends in late August AD 79. In Pirates, the four children solve the mystery of the disappearance of children from the ref refugee camp who are kidnapped by pirates and sold into slavery. The book deals critically with the treatment of slaves and readers learn about the Roman patronage system. But for the purposes of this presentation, I will focus only on the parts of the book dealing with the aftermath of the eruption. The atmosphere of the novel is created straight from its beginning through a detailed description of the dystopic post-eruption landscape and the death and suffering of the refugees. Flavia and Nubia are searching in the mountains for a plant needed to make a medicine for their friend Jonathan, who, because of his asthma, has been badly affected by the noxious gases from the volcanic eruption, eruption and is now in a coma. Through the eyes of the girls, readers see the extent of the destruction around the Bay of Naples. Herculaneum and Pompey have completely disappeared under the ashes. The aftermath of the eruption is described in much detail, both regarding its humanitarian and ecological effects. Hundreds of refugees are homeless, suffer from injuries and polluted air, mourn the dead and lack essentials, except access to a Roman bath, basic medical care, food and water. In the chaos and after the death of their masters, runaway slaves are shown to take the chance to leave and commit crimes. Lawrence stresses the importance of mental distraction, here in the form of music and drama for the refugees. The arrival of government aid and a visit by Emperor Titus, Titus himself are described, similar to, this, to historical reality. Like in The Secrets of Vesuvius, the historical titles travel to Campania in person to inspect the destruction and the reconstruction. Immediately after the eruption, he sent two curatores restituende Campaniae to, survive, to supervise the reconstruction and also provided financial help. Some of this he paid himself. However, for the rest, he used the inheritances of victims of the eruption without heirs. In Lawrence's novel, the emperor brings food, wine, blankets and medicine with him and praises the work of the refugee camp's doctor, visits the injured and speaks to them. Before his departure, the emperor gives a short speech from his imperial carriage, promising to compensate those who have lost property or possessions, to find and return lost children and runaway slaves, to help them rebuild their lives. He reassures the refugees that an entire legion is searching for survivors and promises to compensate the refugees even if he has to reach in his own purse to do it. Polius Felix, the emperor's agent, is to make regular visits to the camp to help with problems and disputes. Shortly after, Felix indeed brings five carriages full of blankets, fig cakes, flour, olive oil and wine, as well as some soldiers to regulate the distribution. Lawrence, as usual, has done her research to even include de such details as Titus offering to use his private funds to help the refugees. 
The focus of this novel is initially on the aftermath of the eruption, but then shifts more and more towards the mystery the children are solving and the social issue slavery. The humorous historical children's series Flashback 4 is written by American author Dan Gutman. The third book in the series, The Pompeii Disaster, is the only of the four volumes which is set in antiquity. The Flashback 4 are four sixth graders called Luke, Julia, Isabel and David, who are, with the help of a time-traveling device, sent on missions into different times by a wealthy inventor with the codename Miss Z. The purpose of these trips is for the children to take photographs of historic moments. In Volume 3, they travel to ancient Pompeii to photograph the AD 79 eruption. Readers learn some facts about Pompeii and volcanic eruptions in general before the actual adventure starts through the descriptions of their trip to today's excavations and museum at Pompeii, and a school lesson about volcanoes, which includes a practical experiment. At ancient Pompeii, the children are mistaken for slaves and imprisoned. The boys become gladiators, but manage to escape in the chaos of the volcanic eruption. The girls have to work in a fullery. They also flee during the eruption, and all of the children make it back safely to 21st century America with the required photo. The tone of the story is mostly humorous, similar to that of the Rick Riordan books. Unsurprisingly, the story is full of jokes about the work of Fullers. There are, however, many stereotypes such as boys lacking interest in academic learning and girls being either bookish or fashion bugs and obsessed with their mobile phones. The novel is prefaced by a quote of Pliny's description of the horror of the eruption, which is quite at odds with the flippant tone of Gutman's novel. Warning signs of the eruption mentioned are, like in many contemporary children's books on the topic, a mixture of general knowledge about volcanic eruptions, in particular unusual animal behavior, mixed with those found in ancient sources. The focus in the description of the disaster is on its loud sound, in graphic novel style, and then, the Ves and then Vesuvius erupted, boom, or the thick brown line shooting straight up from the top of Mount Vesuvius looked like the mountain was punching a hole in the sky. A striking difference to the other novels discussed is that here the children know that they can escape the disaster by time travel. Running from the eruption, they even have the nerve to make jokes about their smelliness, taunt a gang of teenagers, and when they arrive back in the US, they burst out laughing, seemingly more out of silliness than relief of having escaped the disaster unscathed. The characters in this book do not possess much psychological death, depth, and so it is not surprising that the disaster results in no character development. The themes of the novel are, besides the eruption of Mount Vesuvius, the science behind volcanic eruptions, and the excavations at Pompeii, Roman everyday life, slavery and gladiators. Social issues are hinted at, but not explored in depth, like in this short passage. For once, the rich and poor people of Pompeii were equal. It didn't matter anymore how much money or possessions they owned. They had lived separate lives, but they were going to die together. Gutman's novel, despite its overt focus on entertainment, is clearly supposed to be didactic, but the author tries to hide the didacticism in humor and an ostentatious anti-intellectualism. So the author starts the chapter about the geophysics of volcanoes with a pretend warning, which is supposed to downplay the didacticism while, somewhat absurdly, at the same time trying to convince his young readers to engage with the information in the chapter. He writes, To the reader, before we continue with the story, a word of warning. This chapter includes quite a bit of information about volcanoes. Now, if you think reading about volcanoes could possibly be boring, feel free to skip ahead and flip to the end of this chapter when things get exciting again for the flashback 4. But you'll be missing out because volcanoes are very cool, so you may want to stick around and read the whole chapter. Gutman explains that he is trying to reach reluctant readers, as he himself used to be one. All these examples demonstrate how much the topic of the AD 79 Vesuvius eruption still appeals to children. One reason for its popularity is the suspense inherent in stories about the survival of a near-death experience. In this case, the visually and acoustically spectacular and rare event of a deadly volcanic eruption. The characters in most of these books are given sufficient psychological depth to allow readers to identify with them and experience the natural disaster through their eyes. We already find this approach in the letters which Pliny wrote of his and his uncle's experiences of the 1879 eruption, here in a first-person narration. Pliny's retelling of the event as a personal experience has clearly lost none of its appeal since antiquity. 
Moreover, such survival stories work particularly well in order to bring about a character development in child protagonists, often alongside a newfound confidence in their own capability to problem-solve or take on leadership roles. It is obvious when Milon, at his arrival in Egypt after the disaster, feels none of his old fear of the new, and Flavia quickly forgets her own troubles when she finds a lost girl in the mountains by the refugee camp and a new mystery to solve. All of these books have hopeful endings. The protagonists survive physically unharmed or with only very minor or temporary injuries, and so do their families. A striking moment of hope at the end of a number of these depictions of the disaster is when the child protagonist can see light after the complete darkness of the eruption. To quote one example, The endless night had ended and day had come again. Behold, said a soft voice beside Flavia, the sun, they had survived this volcano. As we have seen, all of the novels discussed make use of ancient sources. In several of them, Pliny is mentioned or even appears as a character, especially in Rawls's Secrets, where he plays a prominent role. The wealth of archaeological evidence about Pompey helps map out the text, enabling young readers to envision the book characters walking through the ancient city. To support this, many of the fictional novels on the topic include a postscript with historical information or maps of the city and area, plans of individual houses or photos of ancient Pompeii. The high degree of faithfulness to details of the disaster, as told by the ancient sources, points to the fact that all of these stories have a more or less real didactic purpose. The didacticism is twofold. On the one hand, it strives to impart knowledge about an important historical event, as well as about the everyday life and living conditions of Romans in 1st century AD Italy. Here it is particularly striking in how many novels early Christianity plays a central role. In Streitz and Lawrence's case, this is clearly an important agenda of the author. On the other hand, readers of some novels, most notably Flashback 4, also learn about the geophysics of volcanic eruptions. It seems rather incongruent that Gutman's so ostentatiously anti-intellectual narration is in fact the novel that is most obviously didactic, for example in the school lesson about volcanoes work. Finally, disaster stories lend themselves to dealing with universal topics such as fear, courage, death, grief, friendship and hope. Beyond these themes, the Vesuvius disaster, as I hope to have shown, is even though it is a historical event that is well known through literary as well as archaeological source sources, malleable, malleable enough to be employed in a number of ways in these stories, as backdrops for other events, as catalysts for character development, with a didactic purpose and, of course, for adventure and entertainment. To conclude, no matter the nationality of the author, or whether the novels were written several decades ago or recently, the eruption in these books is a part of wider narrations which mostly focus in so on social historical issues and personal experiences. This is not new to contemporary children's literature. Already Pliny's purpose in writing Letter 616 was not merely to depict the eruption, but foremost to give the account of the death of a great man whom he portrays as a hero. It has been rightly noted that this focus on just one person, or only a few persons, reduces the catastrophe to a human dimension, which is exactly what all the novels I have discussed achieve, achieve too. <laughs>